there. My name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. In part one of this interview with Disabled Angling Association President Terry Morsley, we kick things off with you as an able-bodied person serving Queen and Country in the Parachute Regiment, working through your disabled history to present day, highlighting some of the many standout milestones along the way, which I described as your fight for disabled angling rights over a period of around 40 years. But is fight really the appropriate term here? How would you describe it? It's been a fight. It still is a struggle, and the main part is educating people, which you've indicated yourself. I mean, the fight was initial, and sometimes you need to put those gloves back on and sort of flex your muscles. The struggle is continuing. I mean, it never gets easier. I think until we educate the people about how important and what their responsibilities are as governing bodies, as public bodies as club members or individuals it's going to be a continuing struggle and education quite rightly is the main thing trying to get the real message across to people is the hardest thing to do because they listen but for some reason they don't actually understand i can give people a set of guidance that lays down just like the building regulations for England and Wales and and I can give them the British standard and I can say right you need to build this like that I can go back six months later and I say we've done that and I'll say does it look like this and they'll go no and I'll say but why doesn't it look like this well I thought it'd be better like that but this is the design guidance yeah but it looks better like that so they don't listen and I think, personally, it has a connection with the disability. It's from my own personal experience that when somebody talks to somebody that's in a wheelchair or seems to have a head injury or something like that, they don't give them the same respect as if it was a non-disabled person sitting in the seat next to them and having the conversation. And that part is worrying because it's from top level. It's from government level through to environment, departmental level, through to the fisheries, to the funders, and and all the way down. We come across it on a daily basis, and it never goes away. So trying to get the real message across that the British Disabled Angle Association, for one, and disability rights and access to goods and services is a duty by them all to do. And we are there, and if we can't get you to listen, we're going to have to bang a drum we don't want to bang. So it's a hard one because it's back to the lip service again and it's like you want to get this message across. But the message is you need to make yourself aware that there are organisations out there that you need to listen to first before you go off and do something. It's no good coming back to us after you've built a fishery and saying, do you think we built that right? The proper way would have been come to us first, tell us what your plans are, We'll go all through the different measures, where, who it's for, what it's for, where it's going to be, and then build it. But, you know, it's always a bolt-on, so that's the real message. What about changes in able-bodied people's attitudes towards disability? There is a slight improvement in people's attitudes. It is very slight. It's a lot like the race issue and the gender issue, the... They know there's a big stick behind there, and if you say the wrong things or you're derogatory or something like that, somebody's going to come down on you at some point and they're going to club you. So in private circles, what happens is that the jibes and the jokes and the spacker bus and the lick in the windows, and, you know, we teach that. I'm not being derogatory myself. We use that sort of terminology in our work and in awareness because... That's a sort of playground jargon that's bandied about that adults use and kids only know about it in schools because adults use it. And so it's passed down. So I don't believe that in social elements at ground level, attitudes really haven't changed towards disabled people. They're still seen as the same sort of lower class, doesn't matter, say what you want, ridicule, take the mickey. That's still there. I live on a council estate, and I know that's true. And that's a shame, because it's only in this public level where 
it's not nice to talk about black people, it's not nice to talk about gay people, it's not nice to talk about disabled people in a certain way. But that's all show, because underneath that surface, that goes on. And he obviously goes on in high-ranking areas, uh, like Glenn Hoddle got chucked out for a remark that he made in football about some disabled people when he was an England manager. And he's still working and stuff like that. So the attitude is still there, and it's still not taken as serious as it should be. And what about attitudes of organisations with the power to bring about change? There are changes being made through legislation, but the government have a tendency to backtrack on these things. If it was a building regulation and they said you could build your footings two centimetres deep instead of two foot deep, they wouldn't change that. They would still leave it at two foot deep. But because disability doesn't have the same clout, when it comes to equality they change the goalposts to suit themselves. So one minute they're saying you can't discriminate it this way, the next way because it suits the government and their financial budget, so you can do whatever you want. We've taken these elements out now, and it's no longer discriminative if you say this or you do that, and it's to suit their welfare reform act, basically. But I'm sure that as we go through the years that it will change. For me, in the last 20 years... I haven't seen much change in attitudes. I've seen more in legislation, less in attitudes, but I've also seen a lot more exposure of disabled people getting out there and standing up for themselves, which helps to change those attitudes. So it's it goes back to the first question. It's all about educating people and making sure they're out there in society because if their faces are out there, and they're winning, and they're beating people, and they're like up in the sort of uh, the the I can only say the the theatre of life. Then, if they're there and they can be seen, then it's the old saying: can't be seen, you can't be heard. So, I believe that there are changes, slight ones, but at the end of the day, it's always sad to look back and still hear the jibes. People think it's funny as an ex para. Parish regiment rather than a Paralympic. Sometimes I find that quite cruel to think that if I'd have stood there with a rifle and supporting you in the country in, in the Gulf or in Afghanistan or somewhere like that, you would never have dreamed of saying the things that you say now. But because you don't know what I did, you think you got the right to say what you want in whichever way you want. And you wouldn't give me two thoughts. Life's strange in that way. I've seen a few successes in my time is, um, of the fact that the NFA actually started the World Series, if you like, with the World Games, although other angling suffered because what happened was that the home internationals had to be stopped because the internationals would be concentrated on. That was a good move. I mean, if it wasn't for the NFA, despite some of the things that they didn't do correctly, they did a lot of good for angling, and those were probably a success in a small way. It's like a 50-50, half success story, half failure story. And I think that sums up a lot of what angling's about, from my point of view, is successes and failures. And that is a classic example. But they are only 50% success and they're only 50% fail. And there's never a complete success where at the end of the day you say, look, that's all working. But there's probably the same where it's like it didn't completely fail. So that's quite a good question. There's no major successes, there's no major failures. It just stays where it is. And we'd like to see that rise. From our point of view, I suppose, that the the Environment Agency, the success that we've got heard and things are being done is quite remarkable. The failure part of that is that that's not continued on anymore and, and uh, they've not really listened to what that whole getting the message across means. So it's 50-50. I think that's all I can say is for every success, there's a part failure, but there's only part success. That sounds a bit crazy, but that's how it is. So what then still needs to be done? Easy. Absolutely crucial question is what needs to be done. All they need to do is listen. That's all they need to do. And if they sit back and listen... And then they react and act on those concerns and they implement a plan. It could be put right. And it could be put right in a short period of time. But 
The main thing that stops that is money. Because at the moment, with governing bodies, what happens is that money is put into projects by Sport England, and those projects will have a specific target. And if disability isn't in that target, the governing body isn't allowed to spend that money on disability. And people that's in the normal angling world wouldn't understand that. I think that's wrong. But if we talk to the governing bodies or the environment agency or whoever it may be, if they don't listen to what the concerns are of disabled people, they can't put them right. But it's no good just listening unless you're going to implement some of the ideas that they say. And if they feel that the money could come to a different organisation other than them, they won't support that ideal that you're looking for. So what needs to be done is listen. There is a whole mass of things that could be corrected just if people listened and listened at the high level and reacted to the people what people want, not what they want. So it's not about ticking boxes, it's about real choices. Fill us in now on the background, plus the day-to-day workings of the British Disabled Angling Association. BDA, its structure is the AT uh, registered charity in England and Wales, and its coverage is the whole of Great Britain. So we were registered back in 1995. We can be found on the Charity Commission website. We don't have staff because we couldn't afford to pay them. Everything the BDA does is actually does it, and it raises its own money. We can't get money off governing bodies. We can't get money off the lottery, so whatever we get, we raise ourselves through fundraising or we have donations. Um, That's just the nature of the beast. The governing bodies believe that they already do what we do, which which is evidently not true, but because they're recognised as the governing body, that encompasses disability as well, so they get the funding for that, and that leaves disability, or BDA if you like, without any sort of regular income to be able to do that in affiliation it's mainly that we work in partnership rather than affiliation so we're partnered with like the royal society for accidents rospa the center of accessible environments the environment agency we work with the angling trust the wheelie boat trust there is so many different organizations that we partnered with that if there was an organization or a department that had an interest in angling we would more than likely work with them at some stage and they class us as their partners. So the norm is that these days that when you do any work with a body and it seems that you're actually working with them to improve something, they then class you as a partner. So you don't get to class them as a partner first, they class you as a partner. And as long as it's not a financial contractual partner, then you're a partner. Basically, you're working in association or affiliation. And in an official affiliation, we are affiliated to the Angling Trust. And we have to do that in order to be able to work with the Angling Trust, which is a strange situation. The way we're uh, actually affiliated with them is that if we want to work to advise the governing body, we have to be paid members affiliated to the governing body to give them advice. A strange way of working, but that's the way it works. Our aims and objectives are very simple. It's to make this country a more accessible place to enjoy the recreation of angling. Now, the objective itself is to encourage people to understand what's required, whether that be disabled people, whether that be fishery owners, government departments. So the objective is to spread the word that angling itself is for everybody. It's not just for superheroes and television stars and stuff like that. That's uh, It's for everybody, and it should be for everybody. So our aim and objective is to hopefully, as we go along, make those changes so that becomes a more accessible environment for people. And if they struggle on the way, once they've got that sort of access and facilities sorted, we also need to make sure that we can equip them to to be able to carry out this activity. So it's all right, well, all well and good having the aim and objective to sort of feed the world, if you like, in angling terms, but without actually being able to get people to coach, teach, train and adapt the equipment to be able to get people out. Just having the fishing areas there will only help the people that's already 
in fishing, it won't help the people that's were sitting there on the outskirts waiting to come into fishing. So the holistic approach to improving the environment and its structure throughout England, Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland and anywhere else that wants us to do it. A working area for BDA is Great Britain, which I mentioned, but we can still work outside and worldwide, but we can't trade with other organisations. We couldn't get paid by America as a charity because our jurisdiction ends in Great Britain, but we can still give the advice, which is what we do now. The limitations? We don't really have any limitations. I suppose manpower limitations and the finance. The finance is not really a limitation because we've managed now for 15 years with nothing. Where we've earned the money to do the projects, what we've done is we've put ourselves out there and if the Environment Agency has said we want to improve a project, we've had an agreement where they pay the charity... I think it's £500 to carry out a full audit. That audit would normally cost them £2,500 in the commercial world, in the public world. But as a charity, we just say make a donation to the charity of that amount of money, we'll give you a full report, which costs us about £350 to produce it. But that extra money then goes into the coffers that actually allows us to do other stuff. So that's a good thing. People just offering us help and volunteering So if the money ran out tomorrow, it wouldn't harm BDA because the, the, I suppose, the the strength behind it is that people want to succeed. The money makes it easier to succeed, but it doesn't make it sort of open or close. Fun is very hard. I don't think it's hard for anybody. We would like to be recognised, so some of the funding that the other governing bodies seem to get easily could be directed into disability. At the moment, there's no money for disability, and we just find that hard to understand. But I'm sure that at some point we'll be able to swing the tide. In the main, disabled angling seems to be concentrated on coarse fishing, which in some ways, I guess, will be the easiest to deliver in terms of access and ability to participate. I would imagine that fly fishing and sea angling, particularly from the shore of the bank, are not quite as accommodating. But again, that's my able-bodied take on things, and in common with many other people, who am I to know one way or the other? Because coarse angling is more popular than fly fishing, if you like, and sea fishing is more sort of like, I would say, not the boat side, but the pier side, is, is more of a leisure activity, a pastime rather than a sporting activity. So in terms of disability... There are more disabled anglers that go course fishing than there are game fishing. However, there are quite a a number of disabled people. There's even an an international fly fishing team for disability that fishes every year. Sea fishing has no governance in sort of where it comes to competition for disabled people. So I suppose you're not biased in, in what you say. The most popular is course fishing because it's the easiest one for disabled people that are living inland to carry out. And fly fishing can be very restricted by cost, purely because of it could cost them like 50, 60 quid for an hour's fishing to catch two fish, then go home. So sometimes it's cost prohibitive. The sea fishing, like you said, it's there are only two or three boats in the country that can actually genuinely take people out sea fishing that can be truly called accessible. A lot of them are, what they're doing is they're diversifying slightly, as in they used to be charter boats for diving. They've got an opening in the side of the door and they will take people on and say, like, we're designed for wheelchairs as well because we've got an opening in the door. But if you were down in Brixham, you would have to get lowered down by a rope on the end of a sort of fish hoist or something like that because there's no other way of getting in there to the harbour. So just by having a boat doesn't make them fully accessible. They have to look once again at the holistic approach and say, right, how do we need these guys to get on? Do we have to look at the tide times? Are we the sort of organisation that can cope with that? You know, you can't just pick somebody up now and lift them and lower them in the boats the old day. So course fishing is the top one. I would say that game fishing is the second most popular. Sea fishing is the third, followed by specimen angling that's got a few followers as well. And that's the hierarchy of uh, angling in, in the disability world. Since the advent of the Angling Trust, which purports to represent all of angling in England, 
How have they embraced the concept of delivering opportunities to disabled anglers, and what more could they either do or champion to progress the disabled angler cause? We have to know the history to understand where we are now. So with the history, we had the National Rivers Authority, and the National Rivers Authority used to run a competition with disabled people. And then the NFA was told that in order to get funded by the Sport England, if you like, they had to amalgamate and they had to have course fishing, fly fishing and sea fishing together, which is good where it goes back to, reverts back to your original question. And they become the Joint Angling Governing Bodies, the JAGB. And what they had to do was they had to become this quango type thing to be able to draw down the money. But part of that meant that Sport England says you have to adopt disability as well. So it wasn't that the NFA wanted disability. They had no choice. So disability was thrust upon them and said, you deal with that. You're getting paid for it now. You're getting funding for it now. So you deal with it. And they didn't know how to do that. And it continued. So the battle between good and evil, if you like, in the old NFA days was it was hard and you had an, a group of non-disabled, which in my terminology now, it, 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 that's how it's said in the old uh, terminology is we an uh, able body. That changes with every year. I don't know whether I'm in a wheelchair user, a wheel bound or whatever I am. It, it, somebody changes it somewhere in government every day. So what happened was that the NFA didn't understand about disability. They didn't bother to learn. So they went along with good intention, that I have to say now, I mean, back in the old days, it would have been John Wayne at the thing, and we would have a fight out of the OK Corral. But looking back in hindsight, I understand now that what I didn't understand then is they didn't understand what they had to do. This whole issue of disability was thrust upon them. They were trying to pull angling all together, and not dissimilar to the angling trust now, which is why I can't see the difference between the two. And they were told that you fire away and you carry on. They concentrated on the element of match fishing and clubs as the joint angling governing bodies. And whether it was sea fishing or game fishing or course fishing, disability didn't come into it. In fact, I remember that the English Federation of Fly Fishers phoned me up one day and said, how do you get on with your funding for the England team? I said, yeah, well, we've struggled for it this year, but I've got some uh, sponsorship. I said, how do you get on? Oh, we don't really have that. The joint angling bodies give us five grand, we just do what we want for the day. I said, that can't be right. Where's the structure? There is no structure. They have to tick a box to say they're supporting disability, and that's how we get it. So we do what we want. We run a competition for the day, it costs five grand. They give us five grand, they say it works. So that was the NFA, and the NFA Salmon and Trout Association and the Sea Anglers Federation were the joint angling governing bodies. And they were also known as the JADB when there was the Joint Angling Development Board. So they keep swapping these names to be able to get the funding in. And from that came the Angling Development Board. And the Angling Development Board was bought in by Sport England because Sport England thought that JAGB, if you like, the three governing bodies, couldn't actually deliver what the Sport England wanted for them to be able to fund this sport. So they created this Angling Development Board to help the bodies that was there already become a proper body. It was a bit like a Trojan horse, because what happened was the Angling Development Board came in, it brought the ethos of Sport England about what the Sport England wanted them to achieve out of this sport and for them to better themselves. And the National Federation of Anglers was asked, do you want to move over and make it, you know, it's a make or break situation. You've got no money left. You've got no people left. You're back in the old days, so unless you look to form a new body, you're just going to disappear. So they had a vote, all these committee people at the National Federation of Anglers and the Sea Anglers, and they decided what, what they'd do was join forces with the Angling Development Board to create this new body called the Angling Trust. And that's where we are today. So it's not just been the Angling Trust has sort of appeared. There's been mechanics behind the trust appearing. And like I said, I can't personally see the difference between the old joint angling governing bodies, the way they were, and the new angling trust. It just seems like the same pub with a different name. And the only difference that I can see personally is it's a little better to talk to them and it's a little better for them to listen. 
the hardest thing we have them to do is to act. We can't get them to do that implementation thing. So we'll sit around the table, we'll have our discussions, we'll find out what's wrong, and we'll offer the solutions, but they won't get acted on if it costs money. Or there's too many chefs in the kitchen. There are far too many chefs in the Anglin Trust kitchen. A bit like the Environment Agency, and I have to say, communication is terrible. Because one person doesn't tell another person anything. And I used to find that in Environment Agency, I'd speak to some guys in the Northwest Fisheries Department, and then I'd speak to somebody in the Sussex, and they would have no idea what they do. They manage themselves. And that's what this is like in the Anglin Trust. It's, I believe they could do something. They're self-appointed, which is never a good thing. They've not been voted in by anybody. Nobody says, we want you to do this. They didn't ask the 1.5 million anglers what they thought. They just said, that's who we are. And I don't know whether in this world of equal opportunities that that was the right way to create an organisation out of a failing organisation. Because it seems that you just set yourself up to fail again. And if the money stopped tomorrow from Sport England, Anglin Trust wouldn't exist. I'm not knocking them for what they're doing. We had to have something or we'd have nothing. I don't know whether the something we've got is better than nothing. (laughs) I suppose, and yet again this is me surmising, that once the access issues are addressed, anglers with some categories of disability, such as low body wheelchair requirement, are in theory at least as capable of actively participating at competition level and even winning as many able-bodied anglers are, as you yourself have demonstrated. In angling itself, it's unlike any other sport. In other sports, what they do is they call that type of integration, they call it mainstreaming, where you can get disabled people and non-disabled people to compete on the same sport. The example of that is the marathon. If you see the marathon, it's the same event, but what it is, it's different stages. So you'll have the wheelchair, you'll have the women's, you'll have the men's, and that's how it works. Angling can't comprehend how you divide these things up because the people in the competition structure of the Angling Trust are the people that run the competitions in the NFA. They're the same people. They've just been brought forward and given a new title, but they're the same people. And they didn't listen then, and they're not listening now. So if you want to compete, it's about who you are, what you are. You don't have to be good to compete you just have to have the money to fish in international scene the reason why you need sponsorship because the equipment over there itself just to fish will probably cost about five grand now anybody that's got a disability is likely to be on benefits and if they're on benefits they're not going to be thinking about buying five grand's worth of fishing equipment to go and fish one day event in italy portugal or wherever for your governing body and the problem then comes is you have to pay for yourself because the Anglin Trust, as the governing body, doesn't have the money to send you. It has to send you because it's a governing body and it's created this competition. But then it asks you to contribute £2,500 to go. Now, 2014, that was the cost for each individual competitor to fund themselves at their own pocket for a one-day event to support a governing body that you're fishing for their team. On top of that, you had to pay £25 per T-shirt for an Anglin Trust T-shirt that you're representing as their team member. Now, that just shows me that they don't listen. Because in anybody's book, if you're a team for Formula One and you're racing for Williams, Frank Williams doesn't want you wearing a Santander hat. He's going to give you the hat. And he's going to say, well, I want you to wear that because it's ours. As in the Anglin Trust should say, You're fishing for the Angling Trust. I want you to put that T-shirt on and wear it with pride. Not that's just cost you 25 quid. Don't get it dirty because your missus is going to kill you. And that whole structure has been bought from the NFA because that's exactly how the NFA competition structure used to work in the past. And the Angling Trust as it is now has said that it's like divided in two. All the biodiversity and all all the uh, conservation and all that side of it is one area, and the competitions is a separate area. So Anglin Trust is divided by 
all the people like Mark Lloyd, etc., they run that side, and Mr. Hyland, etc., they're all running that side, but they, they do not delve in the competitions area. So if the competition lads say, we're doing this disabled competition, and we're doing it on this fishery, that's the way they're going to do it. Now, whether the fishery is accessible or not, irrelevant. That's where they're doing it. But you would be just as capable of winning a match, whether it was for disabled people, able-bodied, or a mix of the two, as you've already proved. Hmm. What I have found is that the easiest thing to do is in order to get some gratification out of angling itself, is to compete in mainstream competition, on the open circuit, if you like. So if you find the fishery that has got the access for you, to, for you to draw a peg as equal to anybody else, because if you can't, and they say, I've got to give this example, if the fishery says we've only got five pegs that you can sit on because it's not accessible, you're going to get a hell of a lot of stick from the other people that are trying to think that you've just got five pegs. Then they're not going to have they're not going to have sympathy with you. They actually get quite aggressive that you've been singled out these five pegs because if you went there every time and you'd only got one of five pegs, you could suss them pegs out in two minutes and you would continually get put on them where they've got to pick out of like probably another hundred. So you need to look at which fisheries you're going to. So pre-select your fisheries, do your homework. And once you get into, once you draw and you get over the nervousness and, and you go in through the draw situation and you've got Kenny Giles on your left and Dave Howell on your right and, and Dave Vincent behind you and you're sat in the queue to get your peg as well, there's like a, an air of excitement and pride. But at the same time, you're nervous because you don't think you're as good as these guys. So you go in and you draw your peg and, and then you go around to your chosen sort of area that you're going to fish set out all your gear, and then all of a sudden, it dawns on you, they're all the same, because they're asking you questions. Dave Harrell's asking you and saying, you know, we'll, we'll use what tactics you use in this day, and you think, well, why is he asking me, he's a top angler. Um, Kenny Giles, can, Terry, can I carry your bait? Why do you want to carry my bait? Oh, well, that's a nice gesture. He's not wanting to carry it, he wants to see what's in it. And it all of a sudden, it dawns that you're a threat. But you're not a threat as a disabled person, you're a threat as a competitor. And you start to realise that you can be the same as everybody else. And you just, from that, at that point, when I went, went in that, that first match that I went into, I realised that I was just the same as anybody else. In another angler's eyes, I don't mean in the official eyes of somebody that's actually trying to run angling. I mean from another angler's perspective, I was just a bloke that was an angler. The wheelchair didn't come into it. And when I won the competition, I mean, it was a big competition. It wasn't disabled. It was like, a mainstream open garbage, I think it was Woodland View or something like that, in Worcester, and they got the top names on there, and they won it. And I took the money, and I took the contributions that they made after in the conversations. It was brilliant. You know, oh, well done and stuff like that. And, you know, you must have had a great day, you know, that was a bit of luck. So I went back and did it again, and again, and again, and again. And I didn't win every one, but I framed. I never come out of the top three. And that, for me showed them that I was serious. I was the same as them. The only difference was that at the end of the match, they could get up and walk and I had a wheel. But when they were sat on their box, it was just like me sat in the chair. And the knowledge came from out of my head. It didn't come from anywhere else. So the skill of catching the fish and the way that I was catching the fish was exactly the way that they were. And that sort of reacted with them giving me a huge amount of respect, which I still get now in the angling world purely because I went on those open matches rather than just sticking to the disabled matches. So in that context, there are times when able-bodied matches, if you like, non-disabled matches, able-bodied matches, and disabled matches can work. But there are other times when they have to be specific disabled matches and nobody else, unless you've got a disability, should be able to fish them. And that's when it comes into this whole Sport England classification and categorization elements if it's a social event there's no problem if it's an open event there's no problem if it's an official by the angling trust then it has to be either disabled or non-disabled so where are we now in 2014 on the road to able-bodied disabled angler equality can it and will it ever be achieved i believe it will i have to believe that i believe it will be achieved 
we need more people to speak up for themselves. BDA can be the voice of a number of people. But unless disabled people themselves or people that represent disabled people put their views forward for them if they're not up to facing what they would see as the hierarchy of angling like the Angling Trust or the people in it, they just see it as BDA banging a drum. And the more people, more power. So if there's people that have got issues, all they have to do is make their own noise. They don't even have to come to us, just make a noise. You will get, listen, and we will get there. From BDA's point of view, through the hardships that we've found, whether it's been financially or whether we've been given bad press or people have phoned us and says, oh, you don't do anything for me because I can't magic up like £4,000 worth of equipment because we don't have £4,000 ourselves. Um, we get a lot of stick for what we do and we've worked through the hard times. And we will not stop until that sort of question's answered. And we will make sure that we're there and while people need us. In our eyes, if the Anglin Trust and the governing bodies of this country did their job, there would be no need for BDAA. We wouldn't have to fight for disabled people if it was already in place. But because it's not in place, that's why BDA exists. So we will get there. Hopefully one day it won't have to exist and the Angling Trust will encompass everything to do with disability. And if it all works, and then great. You know, we will kind of gladly put on our retiring cap and move off to some nice place in Surrey and go and have a fish ourselves rather than sit in an office and chatting away about how we can get some other guy fishing when we should be out there ourselves, enjoying what we actually fighting for other people to enjoy, if that makes sense. A great deal of sense, and I'm sure that if a lot of other worthy causes were pursued in the same way, and with the same level of determination, then the world both within and outside of angling would be a much better place. Certainly a much fairer place. My thanks then to Terry Mosley for making us aware of the BDAA and its work. 